Welcome everyone to GIQ Podcast, a podcast where we talk about League of Legends and the Oceanic community. I'm your host, Alyssa, and joining me today is Ethan. Hey guys, um, thanks for tuning in. We're joined by the Oceanic Riot Shoutcaster, Spawn, as well as the jungler of Avantgarde Ascension, Carbon, and Erect Gymnast, his support. <laughs> so, for all of our viewers out there, could you, Carbon, and you, Bryce, both talk about who you are in the community? Oh, maybe we'll just start off with Carbon. I was going to say, I thought I was supposed to let Bryce go first, but he's uh, disappeared. Um, well, yeah, I play jungle and um, the captain for uh, AVA, Avantgarde Ascension, and uh, we just qualified for wild cards in Germany. Um, I think that's about it. <laughs> well, again, welcome back to our podcast. Glad to uh, be here. Congratulations! Yeah, it's great to have you on the show. <laughs> now we also have Jake here, aka Spawn. He recently was in Perth for the winter event doing shoutcasting for Riot. Could you tell us a bit about yourself and where you came from? Okay, cool. So pretty much I'm the color caster. So Max is the play-by-play or Atlas. and So I am the person that does all the analytical stuff at the caster's desk. Um, where I came from is I've played League since Season 1. Um, I was never very good at it, but I played on a couple of teams. Um, and then pretty much when the opportunity came up, I just took it from right, and they were good enough to let me host Winter. Cast Winter. <laughs> Beautiful. All right, so we're going to ask what everyone's overall feelings about the event were, and we know we've got pretty high spirits at the moment. Let's start off with you, Bryce. Um, about the event? No, it was really cool. Well, obviously, we won. Um, it was a great experience. Even going to the event like Autumn where we lost last time, yeah. Yeah, was a lot of fun. So going into it, um, yeah. yeah, it was just pretty stoked. We just came out on top. It was good. What about you, Jay? Cool. So obviously that was like my first live event. Um, being a shoutcaster at it was different, I guess, but it was pretty cool. Like it was really organized. I thought that that was really well presented. And of course, to have an upset in the finals and a game fine was pretty sweet. So couldn't really get a better game of League of Legends, I don't think. <laughs> and lastly, you two? Um, yeah, I thought it was awesome. I mean, aside from us winning, obviously, I think this the show itself was really good. Um, the crowd was a lot bigger than that than that um, autumn, even though like. So they gave us more space this time. They gave the crowd more space this time. Um, but they filled that out again. So for the next one, they're going to need even more space. So that's, that was pretty sick to see. And then outside of that, like the production and stuff, that was all really, really good. Um, and Riot had a lot of help when we had issues. So all in all, like it, it, regardless of us winning, like the event was just really sick. I'm very glad to hear that, guys. Now, just a reminder to our community who are watching, we do have two Riot Ward skins to give away for everyone that does ask our uh, ask our guests community questions. Now, these skins are for people that ask the two best questions, so be creative, be funny. We'll be reading them out at the end of the show. <laughs> so... Now, I do want to ask what everyone's thoughts were. This is the first event that we have had in Perth. What were your guys' thoughts on Perth in general? Bress? I was in the city. Oh, it was all right. Um, oh, no, I come from Canberra, so it was, it was hotter than there. It was, the weather was better, except for the fact that it rained. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. It was, it was good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I guess... Perth's weather was okay. It rained a couple of days, which kind of sucked because Perth's notorious for being kind of good weather. On the Monday when we were leaving, the weather was awesome. It was like 18 and sunny. Um, the actual venue was really cool because we were, as soon as you walk through the convention doors, we were like the first thing you saw. We took up so much room. Um, and the crowd was surprisingly big, I guess. Like the Perth people came out and really showed support. So community-wise, Perth did a f pretty good job. And Carbon? Um, sorry, what was the question? <laughs> um, how did what you feel did you about think about Perth in general? Like the city? Yeah. 
um, which is interesting, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> very, very different to Melbourne. Let's put it that way. Um, yeah. We went out a fair bit, and like, it's just so quiet there. There's just like no one there, like ever. And we we're just like walking around the street on like both Friday and Saturday night, and it was just like. I don't know. I was just like looking around. I was like, "What the hell is going on here? Where is everybody?" And then uh, there was a there was a bar showing the football, and the Crows were playing. So I thought, "I'll go and I'll go and watch the football." The bar was called Melbourne Bar. So I was like, "You know, <laughs> whatever." So I go into Melbourne Bar, and they don't even have bloody VB on tap or even bottled. So I was like, "I'm not what kind of Melbourne Bar this is, but not <laughs> this is not the sort that I'm going to come back to." <laughs> Okay, I just have one more question. What do you guys think about Riot having an event in Perth being on the other side of the entire country? Fun fact, just before we go into this, apparently Perth is the most excluded capital of any territory in in the world. Uh, I guess I'll go first. Um, I guess they have to share it around a bit. Like all the other major cities are on the on the other coast, so and that's where most people come from. So it was a bit like the flight's worse, like a five-hour flight rather than like a I don't know half an hour or one one or two hour. Yeah, the, but, flight, um, the I time guess, difference is killer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, I don't know. I guess they have to share it around. Can't have everything on the east coast, so no, it's all right. It's not too bad. Not all the Perth people will be happy, obviously, because there was like quite there was quite a lot of people there. So yeah, they'd be happy. Yeah, okay, guys. Like, um, oh, sorry. I was just gonna say, like, we had people that drove down from Broome, so like, that's like literally oh, a twenty-hour drive to come watch it. So you understand exactly why Riot put it over there. Like, community-wise, it was probably a really smart idea, and you could tell by like how passionate the people were. Like, the community games were like off hook. Like, they were so funny, and like even the people lining up to get autographs. Like, I joined that line, and it literally took me like forty minutes to get to speak to Carbon. So like, <laughs> it was pretty awesome. Okay, guys, uh, moving on to the results of the tournament. First off, congrats to the avant-garde guys for pulling out the win. Um, really well played, guys. Um, what were your thoughts going into the first couple of matches against Curse and IM? What sort of preparation did you do, that sort of thing? Um, preparation wasn't too great, just considering like the timing and I don't know just, just the age of players and us. We're always in like school or university, so like we uh, as a team we had to deal with a lot of exams. Like Chuchu is still in high school even. And like the others are in uni, so we couldn't get as much practice as we liked. But um, we're going in pretty confident, especially like against Curse specifically. Um, how they lost Keen it was kind of like it's like uh, we we have good results against Curse with Keen, so it's not like that was a good thing for us. It was kind of, it was kind of actually worse because um, you go against Curse right without Keen, and then we win, and people just brush it off like, oh, like you should have won anyway, like. Okay, you beat Curse without Keen, so what? And if, if we actually lost it to, to our Curse, even though we didn't, it would just be like, like what, what are you doing? How, how did you lose to Curse without Keen? Are you guys retarded? So it was kind of good and bad for us. Um, I'll let Tim go, how we fed against immunity. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, I just want to touch on what Bryce said as well, in that um, we already had, we had good records against Curse before that, but then when we found out Keen wasn't coming, I was actually pretty disappointed because I thought um, yeah. definitely marginalizes um, a victory against them, particularly because we didn't um, expect to beat IM. Like, we knew we could do it, but we didn't expect to be able to beat them, so, like, we all realistically kind of thought that, like, we would beat Curse and we would lose IM, but that, like, people would say that we weren't any good because we just beat Curse with Keen any without Keen anyway. Um, but luckily for us, we beat IM, so the Curse games don't even really matter. Um <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, um, we didn't get to prepare much for IM at all because uh, yeah, we had two people with exams. One person was on holidays, and you can't scrim with a two-person team. So um, we didn't prepare nearly as much as we wanted to. Um, and somehow, I don't know. I don't even know how we did it. We managed to pull it together. I mean half our comps in that in the last series like we never planned for a best of five like we don't have that many, we don't have that many comps planned like so um we after i think the first two games were like planned comps that we had and then after that we were just like what's good what's up let's pick this yeah. let's see what happens like you know we just prepared um, for like one, the last one pick Zed into, yeah we got yeah so we just like Zed was just like choose actually wanted to play riven 
I was, <laughs> I was like, oh, I was like, Riven's too all in, but like Zed at least have, has like escapes and wave clear, and they picked Nidalee, so we were like, yeah, I like, would last pick Zed, like that's all right, and luckily they didn't take Exhaust, um, so choose could yeah. destroy everyone. Um, and then in the last, the other game, what was that? I think we just, yeah, we just tried to pick the champions that we wanted. Like, we didn't really care about comps anymore at that point. Like, we were so nervous, especially in the last game. We were just like, everyone just pick, like, what they want. And then, like, we just played so safe. Even though I, was, I watched the I watched the replays back, and we were, like, like something like 10, 12K, like, over, like, well over 10K ahead. And, like, we still weren't pushing. And, like, I just remember when we were playing, like, we were so nervous to push and stuff it up and have them end in one go. Like... Yeah. How much does the pressure in those sort of situations where it's in a game five affect the way you play? Do you think it sort of takes a well away from how well you play, or do you think it just makes you play the opposite of greedy, just completely safe to a fault? I feel like that kind of the pressure actually kind of worked in our favor because I am so used to just like stomping everybody. They don't yeah. have much like late game practice, especially late game practice whilst they're behind, and so their default is like. We, well, you saw with a Renekton with Ignite pick, right? Their, their default is like early lane bullies and they snowball off that. And our default is like Siege. Like we play a more like Siege rotational kind of game. Whereas they play like we're just going to stomp lanes and snowball it. So um, the pressure, like making us play safe, actually worked out so well in our favor. Just because of our like comfort champions, I guess, and the comfort play style. Um, but I feel like nerves are like... The games are more intense, especially the game five, but like nerves are only like a big part of it in like game one of like this Saturday. So not even the games against I am like going against Curse, even though we're like confident going into the matches, I'm sitting there like I'm shaking on stage. I'm like trying to, I bought, um, I actually really rely on item sets just um, like when I play at home, I have item sets for every role or whatever. And then I didn't write them down. I'll take a picture or whatever when I went to land. So I went to buy items against Curse, right? And it took me forever, right? And so they were in the wrong slots I and I was trying to... Yeah, well, that, that's another story. But um, I was trying you to rearrange my one. pots. Yeah, yeah, I was trying to rearrange my pots at like the start of the game. My like my hands shaking, and I'm not quite used to the sensitivity. And I'm just like, I'm just like flailing all over the place. I can't get my items right. I'm just like, oh no. <laughs> but um, after the first game, like once you, it, it's just like you kind of just zone everything out. It's uh, yeah, like you once you get into the game and like you're actually five minutes in or whatever, that that's all you really think about. Um, um, yeah, like there's like funny story about the item sets. It's like because he never oh. set them up right, and I think which I think it was in the curse game, like curse game two or something. Curse game two. And, um, we got, we sent the, like the minions were pushing. Like we we won a team fight, but the minions were pushing into our base. So we were like, all right, we'll send one back to hold the towers, and the rest of us. Will no, no, push. I I died. So, I died. Oh, I was okay, really sorry. Yeah. So oh, anyway, but choose I'm um, not choose. Um, EGM was supposed to hold the towers, <laughs> so EGM spawns, and he literally spent about ten seconds in the pool I trying, was trying to figure to find out where Megatron all the Megatron Shut up. Just trying to figure out where all the items were because he didn't have his stupid item sets, and we lost it in the hip tower because he was like scrolling through the shop. Find it. That's so you know, there's a search button. You were just like, yeah, but just like, like, how did if... we lose the tower? What the hell? I thought you were up, and he's just like, I can't find Megatron cloak. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like when, it, when it's just like muscle memory and I'm like trying to buy it I'm like oh oh shit it's not there I mean oh sorry um I'm like oh damn it's not there and so I just took me so long to find it it's actually oh it's so bad it's so rubbish but, yeah. how would you prepare for that next time so you well, don't I'm, <laughs> I'm definitely gonna take a picture of my item sets so I can set them up on the tawny client that'd be great that's the first step I think <laughs> All right, I just have a quick question. You were talking about um, picking the just stomp lanes. What were your guys' thoughts when Swiper finally got to pick his Trindamir? Um, I shit my that pants. Was... <laughs> <laughs> that was... Oh, <laughs> Honestly, they, they like, like... the draft was so perfect for them. Like, unbelievable. Like, that strat that they have, is um, it doesn't actually rely on Trindamir. It's actually it's in the... If they can pick a safe lane for a Nivea... Um, what else do they run? It's like a Nivea Ziggs. Yeah. So with a Nivea Ziggs, Ziggs they have really good um, zone control in the lane. Mm. So like if they siege, they can set up the wall and they can set up the mines and like you can't move. Um, so what they do is they just like, they keep walling you out and keep mining the floor so you can't engage while they have a really strong split push champ. But what we did is we were really afraid for Minky because we were like, um, I think they banned out Jax or something and we were like, well... And the was uh, and uh, Yeah. So we were like, well, let's... Like we were, we thought that their approach was going to be to try and take Trundle away from Minky, to like leave him on something like that he hasn't practiced. So we, we had to prioritize it, um, Trundle. It was that no tanks were up and Trundle's so good against. I mean, sorry, no, all the damage top laners like the Viber ones, like Jackson and Aureli were banned. So we picked Trundle, yeah. thinking that they pick a tank. And then yeah. Um, and then 
and then they went for Trin, who just destroys Trundle. <laughs> so not only did they have like the perfect anti siege, but like they had Trindamir into Trundle, and then like in game, he Minky stuffed it up early as well. Like we knew that we knew Elise, we knew they invaded our red, and we knew Elise was there. And I said we because we had to trade buffs, and I said, look, Elise is going to come from either behind mid or bot, um, but probably bot because I think Chus was getting pushed in, and then yeah. Uh, Mickey pushed out a little bit too far and Spook showed up at exactly the right moment and um, the snowball began. And he died and burnt Flash as well so he could just keep coming back and he's, it was like something like 04. At he was like 04 in like 10 yeah. minutes or something. I don't like, know what it was. We were, it was at almost that point, we were just, we're just like, yeah, oh, At that God. point, we were just like, we just wanted the game to be over so we could start again. Like, <laughs> <laughs> we were coming back from that. that was, do you think that Minky's Renekton will ever be good enough to bring into competitive play? If he practices, is it? Yeah, we've been Do trying to get him to play help? that for, we've been, we've for been a trying. very long time. Sorry, Minky, played, <laughs> Minky, started, Minky, like, Minky only started playing top at the start of this year when we needed a top laner because mm -hmm. um, there aren't really any top laners in OCE, like in solo queue. Or, like, there are very, very few top mains. And, um, so we decided, well, why not take... like. A player who's like pretty good at mid and like just move him to top in a different solo lane, just different champions. Um, and he's had, <laughs> I don't know, six months now, I guess. You <laughs> say it every week, and he's just like, oh, it's just such a shitty champ, I just don't want to play it. He, oh, like he forced himself to like one week, and he was something like one and 12 in his rank stats, and he dropped so much elo, and it was just, he just quit. He's just like, no, nah, I can't deal. I can't it deal has... with the crocodile. We did play it a bit though at one stage in scrims, and it didn't go too bad, but not enough. It's it wasn't at a high enough level for us to bring it out in game five against Immunity. Yeah. They did. Well, they uh, took uh, it anyway. Uh, yeah, they did. Quick question about the picks in um, the Supernova tournament. Um, do you think that things like Zig support will really like those sort of unconventional picks? They're surprise picks. Are they sort of BM in a way, or do you reckon they're viable in any way on an international stage um i don't think it's viable like it works really well in that anivia comp but other than that like we we'd seen them pick it against nv they picked it against nv in game in the first day right and then we had to go back that night and we were like planning what we're going to do against im and we're like okay what are we doing in zig support and like we came to the conclusion that we just didn't care like it wasn't it's not that great in lane or like well it has poke in lane but there was if like leona's up or something like that it's just it's not something that we really worried about. Like, unless he goes something ridiculous in laning phase, like 5-0, and gets enough AP to basically be a secondary AP carry, then he's going to be, like, impossible to deal with. But with limited AP, he doesn't offer much utility. And, like, mage supports, unless, like, just in general, like, with LeBlanc support and stuff like that, that are other sort of, like, cheesy picks, unless they go really big in lane phase, other supports just outscale them with utility. Like, they just... Because they're pure damage. In late game, if they don't have tons of extra gold, they're just not going to do damage. So, yeah, I don't know. Right here. Hmm? I don't know. <laughs> Jake, you go. From a casting it. point of view, like uh, it makes it really hard for Radier to play conventional AD carries because I'm sure he would have loved to pick up an immobile carry like a Cogmore or a Jinx or something like that. But without peel from your support, like if you don't have a Leona or a Thresh or someone like that, they offer so much more peel. So yeah. like it literally leaves that dude in the lurch to play stuff like Ezreal every game. And it, really uh, yeah, I just felt so sorry for him. Even I think, it, oh, you go to. I was just gonna say, um, just on the Ezreal pick, because I've been asked that a lot by different people, and, and I saw a lot of comments on Reddit as well talking about Radio picking Ezreal every time. And I think a lot of people who don't know um, the pro scene that well, or at least don't know I am that well, don't realize that um, Ezreal is Radio's best champion. And when he's nervous, he pick he he goes back to the Ezreal because he plays it so much and it's so safe. But I definitely think what Jake said ties into that in that they're picking Zig support every game or like Nunu support or something else. Like he never really has the peel to be able to play to be able to play like Jinx or or uh, Cog or or whatever. And yeah, especially they against Nami. Carbon because Carbon sits on AD carries so much in games with Elise. Like it's <laughs> so funny to watch. <sighs> yeah, I love it when people well, pick champs with no escapes. Makes my job a lot easier. That at least. Yeah. Um, quick couple of questions for Spawn. Um, uh, apparently, you thought it was going to be a 3-0. Um, considering that sort of look going into it, how do you? How did you feel about the final as a whole? 
I went the opposite. After seeing like game two without Shelby on uh, Keen, I was like, I was very, very worried for AVA. Is the nicest way I could put it. Um, however, what I didn't take into account is how good their pick band phase had been all tournament, which like. And they literally won the bat off the... Like, they won game one really well. Game two and three... Even game three was kind of a stomp, with all due respect, in favor of immunity. Four and five, they won in pick band phase. Like, they... Great, game five, as long as that game went over 22 minutes long, AVA were eventually going to win it. Unless Swiffer hit, like, the best five-man ziggle of all time. And he even hit a four-man ziggle at one point, which absolutely chunked him. And they still couldn't win the game of how good Swiffer was playing. So I, I guess the one part I didn't give credit, and Pastry Time said it like during the the day before, he was like, they're just going to beat them around the map because he actually picked AVA. He's like, they're going to beat them around the map and they're going to beat them in pick bands. And that's exactly what they did. Um, another quick question before about you speaking about Ezreal on radio. Um, what do you think about the... F with a lot of the... Um, vlogs and blogs released by the pros lately about um, 4.10. Everyone seems to be saying that Ezreal is literally the worst ADC in the game right now. What are your thoughts on that sort of thing and bring it into pro play when it's seen so poorly internationally? Uh, I think you can play Ezreal, but I think you need to go block. So, like, I said to Radia even before 4.10 uh, that uh, if his build had been Trinity Force Blade of the Roman King, he would have been a lot safer and been able to do a lot more consistent damage. Um, I think at the moment you have to go blue build Ezreal with a Blade of the Ruin King uh, if you're going to play Ezreal at all. Um, he, it's a different kind of carry. He bring, brings a lot more control, allows you to uh, play a much heavier kite comp whereby you just kite people backwards continually. And then when the chase happens, he's a very, very good chase champion as good uh, well because he has obviously the gauntlet in that build. So I think blue Ezreal has a place, but I don't think uh, normal Ezreal at the moment, as in BT Triforce until Last Whisper, has a place at all because there's just not enough consistent damage and he can get blown up really easy. Um, a quick question about analysis for the AVA guys. Um, we've been told that you guys had a long night of just sitting around and out analysis, uh, analyzing the um, games that I am played just before you went into the finals. Um, do you mind going into a bit of detail about that sort of thing? Like, what sort of uh, factors of the game do you focus on? Um, Who did you hear that from? Just curious. Uh, a good reporter never reveals their secrets. Oh, okay. Because, like, we we spent... What do we do? We spent that... We Like, we watched our VODs um, of, our, of us winning, because watching yourself winning is a really good morale boost, you know? Um, <laughs> and then... That yeah, yeah. Um, but we did. I don't. Did we watch the IM games? I'm not actually uh, sure. I don't, I don't think we know. did. We, we, we did watch the IM games. Yeah, we sit around drafting. Like we had a, we had a notebook. So we went. We went full lamination, and we're just like <laughs> we had like this sort of like mini, like sort of mini game with this drafting. Where like Minky and Carbon would sit on either end to like couch, and they just sit there like, okay, like here's what we we sort of like read out like what we prioritize, what they prioritize, and like how it's gonna like clash. And what we think they're going to pull out against us. So we have sort of like just prediction like drafts. And so we had, we, and we did like a few for blue side and a few for purple side, right? So we, so we went through like what, what they play and sort of how we think pick band phase is going to work out. But we didn't actually analyze their games against Envy too much because I don't know. I don't mean to BM, but they were kind of stompy. So yeah. It's hard to take much out of, out of, um, games like that like and, and we watched like we watched the games live as well so i was like uh I, actually that's why we didn't watch them because i remember us saying like we only had like there's only so many hours in the night we all wanted to get to bed early but um i said basically my my theory was like we, we watched them live like we don't need to watch them again um but yeah we did we did the drafting game you played a lot so like minky pretends to be curse or i and i pretend to be us we have to against each other until until we get a, until we figure out a draft that's favor, favorable for us. Um, to be honest, I think I don't think that worked either time because um, <laughs> we're a lot we're a lot better at banning ourselves out than other teams seem to be. Um, <laughs> when we played against Curse, um, we had all these bands lined up and like we had this whole draft and like everything. And we were, and we were like, "There's no way Curse can deviate from this because if they do, then like that's bad for them." And then like it got to game day and they like they target banned us all. Like they were all it was all like Lucy and Elise like. Um, they're all target bands as opposed to like meta bands so like we ended up with better team comps every time yeah. um, 
which was definitely at least a factor in game two more than game one. Game, uh, um, game one was game like... two we got destroyed, but like our comp held strong in the end. Um, and if we had not had that comp, and if they had been better, I think we probably almost certainly would have lost. <laughs> but the IM IM was the same. IM didn't ban the way we expected them to either. Really, um, yeah. they even gave like like game literally like like I couldn't have prayed for a better oh. than game one. Like we were sitting there and we were literally laughing because we were like, how could like this could not be any better? Like <laughs> than if they like just didn't ban anything and just let us pick whatever we wanted. Like yeah. that was it was almost like a blind pick. It was like a blind pick draft for us. Like it was just. It was just so dumb. <laughs> I remember um, Kaldrid was freaking out because they left Kassadin open, which is obviously like one of the biggest things. And Kaldrid was just sitting there and I'm sitting next to him. And he's literally just like, no, it's a bait. It's a bait. No, it has to be a bait. And he's like, he's actually like losing it, thinking like, what are they going to do against this? And we're just sitting there like, well, the mind I don't games. know. Yeah, well, like, <laughs> we can't give them, like, we had to pick it. Like, we can't give them Kassadin on purple yeah. side. That's just, was crazy. that's atrocious. And like they did, but it then, was a bait because they had like yeah, the yeah. for fast push. But yeah. like it, we were just like, the matter what the bait is, like it can't. Like all we need to do is just like the, it's like Jake said earlier. Like all we need to do is drag this game beyond twenty two minutes and we win. Like we had Jack's cast Twitch at least. Like it's especially just, when the Kassanen was up thirty CS at one point in farm. It was just like well, choose, choose, you're a god. They picked choose, middle choose is into cast, which is a losing yeah. matchup. So yeah. I don't understand because like Kassanen just altered him and you just and and cues and so like. And the magic shield just like blocks Nidalee's trade, and then like you just can't out trade him. So the only reason he shouldn't be like out trading Nidalee in that point is like if the jungler's around or like he's scared of getting ganked that he can't ult forwards. But like as long as the jungler, like we know where he is, he can just he actually just wins the matchup. So But even before level six he was up in farm. Like oh, he well, literally <laughs> just won the lanes straight up. Yeah, Choo Choo's is a he's a monster. On that <laughs> note of Cassidy. Uh, do you guys feel that a lot of people have been talking about this? Do you feel Cassidy's stronger now than he was before the rework? Uh, no, not. I don't know, to be honest. It's t like we didn't ever really see Cassidy before the rework. Mm. And like when the rework came, people were like not sure whether or not he was still as good. So it was still tentative about banning, like perma banning him out. So I think we see Cass a lot more now than we used to. But like, I don't know. That, like any champion that has like a seven second flash is always going to be broken. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he's more well, versatile, three seconds definitely. now. Yeah, he's definitely more versatile. Yeah. I will say. Before he was like the anti mage. Now he can even play against all AD comps. So, yeah, you saw him again. Yeah, uh, yeah. What was it like? Yeah, Curse vs LMQ, and like Void Boy went just like pure tank cast with like Frozen Fist, and he yeah. like and he just like they just stomped anyway. So it's just like, like you even see him Trinity Force Ranjuan's top lane sometimes in turn. Yeah. Like, so like he's definitely a more versatile pick, which makes him probably even scarier. Mm. Yeah. That's crazy. So we'll talk about what were your guys' feelings coming into this first game against IM in the finals? You saying that you were a bit nervous, that you weren't quite sure, like Car like Cardridge was freaking out, Ejim was like didn't have the right bindings and stuff. <laughs> like, what were, what were you thinking? Were you like, okay, focus, focus, or were you just like, oh god? Oh, you trying like we're trying to like focus, obviously, like. Mm -hmm. I don't know, once you're on stage, like it's all you think about is the game. But um, like the difference between the way us and I am go into it, I think, like Carbon touched on it earlier, um, is that they go in expecting to win, whereas we go in knowing we can, but not expecting to. And so like we we were like confident in like because in scrims we go we go fairly even with them. Um, we're not it's not like we get stomped every game and like taking this tournament off them was like a complete surprise. Like it might be to the public, but like for us we we know we can beat them on occasion. And, um, yeah, I don't know. Um, like, we had, uh, we actually had a really, really cool session on the Friday before um, where we got to speak to a sports psychologist, um, which, which was Riot's idea, which was, like, like the coolest thing ever. Um, but a lot of the stuff that he taught us, we applied on the Sunday. So, like, um, that was about, like, you know, like, concentrating and uh, all, all that psychology kind of stuff. Um, but all we kept saying was just, like, as soon as anyone got off topic or like someone was like freaking out or someone was getting down about us being behind, we'd just be like, no, 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 no. Just like, just remember the, just, his name was Ivan. We'd just like, just remember Ivan. Remember Ivan. Remember what, would Ivan <laughs> what would Ivan say? <laughs> and, uh, everybody, everyone got off in the bed after that. Um, with the, just speaking quickly about comms, it seems like communication is a major issue for many of the biggest esports teams in the world. How do you guys sort of practice that sort of thing? Um, it just sort of comes with practice. Like the more you play, 
the, the, the better you get. Like, Carbon shot calls most things because he's jungler and that role just, like, lends itself to it. And then I sort of transition in more late game. But um, in terms of specifically to the IM games, our communication, like, or what are you saying before, like, when we're getting behind, um, we outscaled in most of our comps, so you kind of just sit there, like, it's fine, it's fine. <laughs> like, you died, it's like, oh, it's okay, it's okay, we outscale. It's like, yeah. <laughs> I don't think anyone can uh, over talk carb in any way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, they, they try, but it doesn't go very well. <laughs> the, alpha, <laughs> the alpha male voice is so real. It's like, um, <laughs> but yeah, no, so yeah. Like, I do most of the calling, but like, everybody speaks. Like, everyone has the, like, like you have this, you get this idea, and there's this idea that circulates in the public that, like, one, a team has one major shot caller who just, like, does all the talking, and, like, everybody else listens, and they just do their thing, and it's just not the case at all. Like, bot lane speaks to each other. Top mid and jungle are kind of like top and mid are always feeding information to jungle. Jungle is kind of talking to everybody. Um, when it comes to like mid game, like deciding what we're going to do next, usually falls on me. But like like late game, it's just like everybody like like we practice enough that like everybody knows what like we need to be doing. So like um, so it's kind of like it's almost like you don't need to say it. like you do, but you don't. Like everyone kind of everybody already knows. So sometimes some certain people just need reminding. <laughs> yeah, um, just to touch on what you said at the start of that, like during during like early game, it's just like because bot lane needs like an open line of communication, sort of like they're just constantly like talking to each other, like because well they're the only lane with two people in it, sort. So like in the ideal scenario, you just have like top and mid, like both solo lane, solo lane sort of giving updates to the jungler, and then the jungler is like making decisions um, based on that information, and then so like so bot lane has sort of like a free line to speak, and um yeah. Oh, that's fair enough. So, you guys, how were you feeling after coming out of game one? Did that kind of eliminate those nerves, or did it feel like even more and more pressure was, like, amounting? Um, Minky actually said on stage, he was, oh, was it? Yeah, I think it was, like, during the pause between, like, game one and game one. Uh, game one, game two, sorry. He was like, we needed to win that game. Like, going in, like, having that first, like, game go in our favor is so important just in terms of, like, um... Mindset. What's the word? Mindset, no, like, uh, oh, what's the word? Um, momentum, momentum, like going into game two, knowing <laughs> that, like, we've taken a game off them, like, on stage. Like, a lot of people, like, well, Spawn predicted we went, um, we'd go 03. So, like, just taking that first game is, um, just, it's, it's really important. I'm yeah. sorry, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll forgive you. <laughs> well, obviously, then, the pressure was on. It was for all, like to all, you guys needed to win the next one. What were you thinking? Did you guys have a moment and just go, all right, this is going to be the strategy, guys. We need to, like, get our butts into gear? Um, yeah, so basically we were just like, game five came along and um, the biggest thing was picking Elise. Um, I'm not sure whether you guys know, but Elise actually won every single game in that series, and I'm pretty sure Elise has won every game in that in that in the entire tournament. Um, so uh, at game four, we knew that we couldn't give Spooks Elise again because that's what he got in the two games they won. Spooks had like done really well with Elise, so we were like, we have to get Elise first. Um, what can we ban in order to pick Elise first without giving them too much? And I can't remember exactly what the bans were, but I'm, I'm pretty sure we accomplished that. Um, and then actually, no, no, because what they did was they picked Threshly Sin first. And then, like, we were just like, just pick scaling champs. Just pick something we can, like, just drag the game out with. Because, like, we knew everyone was going to play super passive. Like, as it was the last game. Both sides were nervous. Like, we knew that everyone was going to play safe. So we just thought, pick stuff that could sail, and then we'll just, like, we'll just split push all game. Like, just lane swap and split push all game. And um, and they went Ignite, Renekton, and, and Lee Sin. And, like, all we had to do, like, it wasn't even the rest of us. All Minky had to do was not die, and we would win that game. And to his credit, he didn't. Yeah. And um, just to do with, like, the way that they picked, like, really early game dominant champions so they didn't scale well, we were um, hovering Yasuo until, like, because they left it up that game. We are hovering Yasuo until, like, the last second. And I, like, in, a, in a, on, like, on stage, you know, like, communications were just sitting there, like, Choo Choo's was really hesitant on picking it because it's, like, why would they leave it up? Because, like, every team almost bans Yasuo against us, like, all the time. Um, and so... He was really hesitant, and then like Tim realizes at the last second that they, because because they had like really early game dominant team, realizes at the last second that we have like very little wave clear with Yasuo, and so like Kadrid's sitting there panicking. I think he swapped over to Oriana because we got that one, and because we were deciding between Ori and Yasuo, 
and um, he swapped over to it in like like after the one second had ticked and you've got that little like <laughs> delay before it completely locks you in and he's like yeah. he's sitting there like oh yo 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 and he just like he just gets it <laughs> yeah it was so close but uh, I don't know how that would have affected how the game went but um yeah well we picked Ori so that seemed to work for us so no, and just talking about nerves going into an event like this, Jake, like we touched on, this was your first event. Well, casting, casting, not playing, because you were at PAX, was that correct? Yeah, so I was at PAX a little bit, and then obviously uh, casting my first event, I would like to give the PR answer like, oh my god, I was so nervous to be in front of all these people <laughs> and stuff, but I really wasn't. Like, I'd done public speaking before heaps, I have to talk in front of a team every day, so I literally got up on stage, uh, nothing new, there was a camera in front of me and I started calling what I was seeing in front of me. So. Not nervous at all. Uh, the crowd actually helped. It made me get a little bit more excited. I know that a couple of people said that I'm a little bit boring to listen to, so hopefully that wasn't the case. Um, but, yeah, no, it was a good good experience. So how do you feel? It was a long day worth of casting. How did you go with that? Did uh, you feel I felt or? like I really needed to go to the bathroom because the pro <laughs> players kept hogging the stalls. Um, so that oh was my great. Lord. <laughs> so every single time on the ad break, we're like, can we go now? And they're like, no, nah, sorry, two players just went. And it's like, oh my God. Guys, please. Uh, but yeah, so that was my first reaction. Second thing was I had confetti in my hair that I wasn't too happy about. Obviously, <laughs> this do takes a long time to do. But um, voice wise, I was fine. Uh, Atlas was completely wrecked. In fact, I had to do pretty much the last. 30 seconds of the game because he couldn't breathe um, but <laughs> as a as a color you uh, don't get to yell that much so my voice was okay um, just moving on a little bit about the other games that Avantgarde had on the weekend um, first off oh not that Avantgarde had the other games on the weekend do you think in the NV versus IM game do you think NV could have performed any better uh, I definitely think um, uh, they could have won one of the games um what did they play? They played Yas, right? They had... Uh, the Yas game wasn't too bad. They were, of like, like they got they lost in lane, um, and they were behind substantial amount of gold, but they had, like, a really strong Wombo comp, and IM's comp wasn't that strong. Like, they had the, they were running the Zig support again, um, which has, like, a little bit of damage, and has a little bit of zone control, but zone control doesn't really do anything against Wombo, because um, the initiation is so quick that, like... That the like you don't have the chance to zone people with bombs. Um, so I remember them being behind like, I can't remember the number. It was like seven or eight k, um, and then and they managed to initiate a fight at, at mid and win. Like they managed to win a fight even though they were so far behind. And I thought that if they could just drag it out and find and get a good initiation on a, under the, one of their towers, that they could um, like swing the lead the other way and like chip away at the gold a bit. And um, I thought that I were going to have trouble sieging, but. Um, uh, after the Baron steal, they just fell behind. They like they stole Baron, but they lost too many members of the team. So I just went in and pushed. Do you think, in the way they were playing, that a lot of that's a confidence issue? Playing against IM and some of the bigger teams, do you think that's an issue with gameplay and nerves, or do you think that's just misexecution? Once they fell behind, the games were over. Like yeah. they would have been so distraught. Like after autumn, like the three zero at autumn, they would have thought as soon as they fell behind, probably even in the first game, like they knowing knowing NV as well, um, they would have just uh, as soon as the they fell behind in the first game, they would have just thought like, oh shit, here we go again, like we're done. Is that sort of a common theme with playing against IM because they're so well known as being the dominant team in Australia? Is it a common thing that once you get behind, it's really really mentally impossible to come back? Um. Maybe for other teams. We actually have never played IM. Oh, stop. Oh, sorry. This is the last question I'll answer, I promise. <laughs> no, sorry. Um, but um, we've, that was actually the first series we've ever played against IM in like an actual tournament. The only other time we played them was against CG and we went 1-1. And that was actually like an online like little league game or whatever. So like we've never had like to play against IM in a big tournament except for that one. But I know it's definitely an issue for other teams. Um, and just one for Bryce. How important do you think it is going in with the knowledge that you can win a game? Oh, <laughs> very important. If you don't think you're gonna, like, if you don't think you can win the game, you're just not gonna win. Like, if you're going in there accepting to lose, then 
like it's purely on mindset you just you, you're going to lose that's uh, yeah. i feel like that's kind of a given like me yeah me and Carter had said on sunday morning of the game we looked at each other and we were just like we're gonna win today and Carter was like yeah we are didn't and, like, you said even to- though we even though we both knew that like everyone thought we were gonna lose just saying it like, i think men like so much yeah, Benji. Benji tweeted something like, "At autumn, you were just like, oh, Benji, wa- wash your hands before you give him my winter regionals jacket, <laughs> something like that." It was just like, that's so good that it worked out. Oh, that's and beautiful. Then, yeah, oh. and then on, dude, on, on uh, you guys wouldn't have heard him, but on stage when he was handing us our jackets, he's like, "I wash my hands, don't worry." <laughs> <laughs> that's so good, dude. <laughs> and just moving on to one of the other games, the curse get the game that you guys had with curse. Um, the second game seemed to be in Curse's favor. Um, what happened to cause them to lose control of that game? Um, I honestly don't remember. Do you want me um, to answer that question? Yeah, sure. Yeah, go, go. Mazui's bought Zonya's Hourglass instead of Death oh. Cap. He would have aced you guys, and Curse probably would have run over the top of you. Yeah, he hit. Um, yeah, that's true. He hit like two four man ults or something like that game, especially in the very last fight. I think he hit like a massive ult, but it just it literally did no damage. I think it had to go through an Aegis shield on like all of us, but um, it still it still just did like minimal damage, and we just like keep walking forward. I think we just walked up and killed um Porky because he'd already ulted or Colo, yeah. sorry on Kale, and then we just and like, don't get me wrong, I'm defense. not BMing the guy. He played phenomenal that series for a guy that came in like with very little exposure. He's a support player. You guys kept target banning his Lulu, but uh, just the fact that he wasn't able to have those high impact ultimates like hurt the team with an Eve. Like she was such a strong uh, mid game carry at that point. So yeah, I just that's my honest feeling of why the game turned a little oh. bit south and went in AV's favor. That was um that was the Eve Kale game as well. And um yeah. what I, I was saying after is like I feel like their comp. I don't, I don't know something. With no follow up. Yeah, yeah. Eve got a perfect flank off in mid lane, like absolutely perfect. She was like completely behind all of our carries, but it's like we just ran, we just r- run backwards through Eve. Like Eve's not actually going to kill anyone. Um, she's going to ult. She's going to get a massive shield, and then she's going to like like mash mash his fingers on Q and hope to do some damage. But then like we we literally just run away from like the rest of the team and just kite backwards, and we even won the fight, even though it was like completely optimal engage for them. So I feel like their comp had something to do with it. But then I don't know the. The Zonya's instead of decap thing was other, was another issue, but um, yeah. Just talking quickly about Mazui, um, how relieved were you guys that Keen wasn't playing? You said earlier it wasn't really even much of an issue, but is the difference between the two players uh, very great for the organization, especially with team comms and that sort of thing coming into it? I hated it. As soon as I heard Keen wasn't coming, I was really upset. Um, we've beaten like. There was this, there's like, uh, there was this idea within the general public that Curse was a better team than we were, um, but we had knocked out Curse at both Autumn Regionals and during ACL in order to qualify for Winter Regionals, um, and that was we, and that was with Keen both times. And when I heard Keen wasn't coming, I already knew that it, winning, beating them, would no longer mean anything. And if we lost, it would be even worse. So yeah. I was, I was, I was not happy that he wasn't there. Just one last note on Keen. Um, it's been pretty well documented that he's absolutely smashed his way through um, Challenger in the NA scene. Uh, do you think he's going to make much of an impact over there? Can you see him going becoming quite well known? Well, I don't know if he will or not, but hopefully he does. Like, even though I feel like Choo Choo's and Swiffer are both better mid laners, I probably shouldn't have said that. Oh. Anyway, I feel like I feel like he wasn't the strongest mid in Oast, like easily. Just the fact that he had Curse as an org was why he got picked up to be like the only one to go to NA sort of thing. Um, and so I hope he does well because he's now like even even if we like it or not, he's like our little star basically. Like if he does terribly, then people are just even more going to look at Oast and be like, oh lol, plat NA, who are these guys? Yeah. Like they're terrible sort of thing. So like hopefully he does well. Um, I don't think he's been like in competitive because he played with Curse Academy already and he went like. One five one or something. So he hasn't been going too well. Like in solo queue, yeah. Like I, I saw his tweet before. I think he's already on like five hundred points with a recruit badge, and he's trying to get to a thousand to be like up there with a recruit badge. Like that'd be really good for him. Like I hope he does well, um, for his sake and for like our sake as a scene. But um, yeah, you just don't know really. Um, one last note about a lot of people have been viewing Oost as a much weaker region. Do you think um with 
how teams have been playing recently and you guys go into the regionals that um, always will be able to ma make a mark internationally? I certainly hope so. Um, I mean, for the most part, like, we, none of us are deluded as to the strength of our scene. Like, you know, we have, like, almost zero infrastructure. We have a very small population. Like, you wouldn't expect... If you looked at the stats for for, for OS, like, you would never expect a good team to be able to come out of OS. Um, but that being said, like, at the very top, like, we do have some pretty good players. And um, we, I am a very, very good team. Um, for anyone who thinks otherwise, like, there's the, that's the, the CJ Blaze game gets quoted a lot, but, like, it's such a good game to watch... Um, as a, a, as an OC team internationally, um, we hope we can do well at wild cards. I'm confident that we can do well at wild cards. Um, but to compare us to like any of the other regions where like the infrastructure set up, players are salaried, like they play every week. You know, like we're all university students, or well, I'm not. I was, um, but like all the other guys are all students. And like uh, other than that, people work. Like for that. For, for other regions, this is their job, and for us, it's a hobby that we are getting good at. Yeah, and I'm um, just like to touch on that. Like we are like for the majority of players, like you know, some of the pro players, they're like students by day and league by night, basically. Whereas like if you can like compare us to like an NA player, or I guess yeah, I'll use NA. Like it is their job to play league, and they play it like however many hours a day. Like it's just not possible, and it's just not financially viable to do that like all day every day. Um, you know, with like just just the amount of money that's in the scene and the infrastructure and like on top of that we have like one big tournament every like couple of months like we've had autumn and then there's been like a month's break or like a, or a couple of months break and then we've had winter sort of thing whereas they play like lcs like week after week like they they have experience in front of a live audience at the like at the top level of play for their region like every week whereas we just don't have that like we can scrim but it's just it's just not the same so just touching on Riot and everything that they're doing for OCE, what do you guys think? Now, this question is directed for you, Jake. Mm -hmm. If you get off your phone. Thank you. No, I'm paying attention. <laughs> um, you were behind the scenes. You saw it all. You saw everything that was happening during the event. What do you think about their production level? Do you think it's risen? Do you think that they're going up ahead in the right direction? Yeah, definitely. Like, Riot are putting everything into it at the moment. So, you got to say that, like, afterwards they take feedback really well. They, like, ask everyone's opinion on what they think they could do better, what went well, like, what we should keep doing, what we should stop doing. So, like, they're definitely moving it in the right direction. And they've got some really awesome people behind the scenes, like, people that you never see that do a great job. So, um, can they take it even further? I think it depends. I think they can get a lot better. But then I think there's going to be a cap on everything carbon, like, listed. Is there enough infrastructure? Can teams buy in? Like, when is it going to be worthwhile for an OS player to not go to university and actually play League of Legends? Because at the moment, like, that decision just isn't viable for a lot of players. Like, even for me, like, as a shoutcaster, I would love to be able to say, you know what, I'm going to give my oil to shoutcasting, but realistically, I need to go work 9 till 5. So, like... I think that there definitely is potential for growth there. I just don't know how quickly it can take off. What about you guys? As players, what do you think uh, Riot's doing? Do you feel like they're going in the right direction for the players? I mean, everything they do is great, I think. I mean, um, Riot OC are doing everything they can to grow the scene, which is fantastic. Honestly, couldn't really ask much more than what they're doing. Every time they come out, every time they announce something new to us, um, it's positive. I'm happy about it. It sounds good to me. Um, One of the big things they did was like the, just the rebroadcast of um, NA and EU LCS, like on the Twitch Riot, um, Riot Games Oceana or whatever. Um, like that was a lot of people don't think about it, but that's actually like a really smart move in terms of our winter games were played right after that. So we went from getting like. I don't, I don't even know what the numbers were for autumn, but, like, they would have been so much bigger for winter purely because you have all these people, like, tuning in who maybe even didn't even know about um, the OS competitive scene. And then even if they thought it was crap afterwards, like, after they watch NALCS and they watch us terrible players down in OS um, <laughs> trying to win a game, like, it just got so much more views. Because we had about, like, 6K or something, and then that gets you on the front page of, page of Twitch, and then you just get so many more people just looking, like, scrolling through League of Legends on Twitch. You just get so many more viewers and stuff so they're just trying to get us more exposure which is really all they can do mm. no that was a really cool idea that they did that i think it was like 
yeah, finals reach like 10,000 viewers. Like, that is huge. You guys just played in front of not only <laughs> the crowd, but 10,000 people worldwide. That's massive for OCE. I mean, like, God, how, how does that make you guys feel? It's pretty cool. It's pretty damn cool. Yeah, Considering, pretty like, good. you just start off like, I don't know, I just start off being a sweaty nerd playing League in my, <laughs> in my room, and then suddenly they want to, like, fly me to Perth, and I get to play on stage in front of 10 k Yeah, sweaty nerd on stage. <laughs> oh, my God. So, ah, it's, just, it's really cool. Like, it's a really good opportunity. So, yeah. So what did you guys feel when Riot sat you down to do those interviews? Was it, like, nervous? Had you done something like that before? Um, not to that, not, like, to that level of professionalism. But, mm. like, I mean, interviews are interviews. They're not that difficult. People ask you questions and you give them your opinion. Like, I don't know. I don't find them hard. Yeah. Like, it's, it's cool and, and all, but, like, yeah, like, I guess what he said. Hmm. Jake, did you have any video time or was it just the written interview? Uh, I had no video time. They did a fantastic photo shoot of me, which was brilliant. Um, <laughs> stay tuned for those pictures. Um, but <laughs> did, did you have the wind blowing? Uh, no, not that, not to that extent. Um, <laughs> to do the squinge. Oh, the, the squinch was so weird. They could have just told it like they wanted us to do like a game face sort of thing and like not smile. I don't know. But they told it the way they explained it was like relax your face and then like close your eyes a bit. And so like we're sitting there just like pulling this retarded face in front of a camera. Like it takes like two or three shots until you realize what you're meant to be doing. And oh, it's just yeah, it's funny. The squinch never again. Yeah, but apart from that, no camera time for me. Thank God. People don't want to see me. They want to see these handsome devils. <laughs> Strategically paced <laughs> ward codes. <laughs> One under each sleeve. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's sad. I do look forward to reading that interview when Riot does release it. Where do you, is that going to be on the website? Jake? Sorry. Ah, oh, the interview. No, they didn't. They photoshopped me they didn't do an interview with me um they did those uh in between game interviews i get guess where i got to show how little i know about league of legends by <laughs> picking curse over avant and then immunity over avant um <laughs> actually in the last article i said that avant would win so i got one right um but yeah so we did those cool little write-ups during the week um but apart from that hopefully now i can fade back into nothingness <laughs> All right, guys. Um, moving on to the new patch that's just come out. Uh, what what does everyone think of four point ten? It's pretty huge. So, what sort of effect do you think it'll have on the pro scene and on how people play in solo queue? Um, well, we only just came back from winter, so um, I've only ever played a hand. Well, I've only played a handful of games really. Um, but the biggest thing is Skarna for me, at least. Like, I loved Skarna before, and then they wrecked yeah. his ruined his ultimate. Like, even the, all the other changes they made like weren't as bad as when they nerfed his ult. Um, I'm not sure whether you guys remember the bug fix where you used to be able to ult and it would always go through even if they flashed afterwards and it would drag them back. Um, they changed that so now if you flash out of the range, it cancels itself. Um, <laughs> well, that was that changed a long time already. But then now, like his kid is so strong that like that doesn't even matter anymore. Like his uh, his passive is so good. Like the damage with the stun, yeah. like with red buff, like it's crazy. Um. I've just, just been playing Nidalee. New Nidalee is so much fun. Like, Bruiser <laughs> top Nidalee, it's... I'm so bad, and I went, like... I think I've, I won a game where I went 0-8, and I'll just, like... You just split push, and as long as as long as someone's there with you, it's, like... It's just frustrating to deal with. But, um... In terms of how it affects, like, pro play, we only just got back. We played it for, like, two days, so we haven't scrimmed or anything with it. Um, so we don't know how it's going to change. Um, the, like... Lucian being the number one, like... AD is no more because he can't build like he can he can still build like Bork a try, but he's just not gonna have like the power spike he did in lane with um what do you call it with BT now that it's like a defensive item. And so like I think AD is gonna change a lot. Like you'll see more like Twitch I think is gonna be the strongest because yeah. I don't think he got nerfed too much. Plus yeah. he built Bork first anyway. So like his build path didn't really change and he's like still as strong. Um yeah. One for you, gymnast. Um, 
Just regarding the new support item and the changes to Mikhail's, uh, what are your thoughts on Ardent Sensor as an item as a whole, and what are your thoughts on them increasing the cost of um, Mikhail's Crucible? Um, I don't think the new item is very good. Like, before it came out, um, Luke, our analyst, AV Atoke, he um, was saying that, like, Alistar is going to be so good because you can just AoE heal, like, minions, and you're just going to, like, play all these fast push comps. But, um... It's such a it's such a gold investment for like a non tank item and like the AP like you, you literally can't use. There's a lot of mana region on it. Like so, I built it on Karma. And I feel like she's one like one champion that will use it a lot because she she has like a, the potential for a five man shield and so she can get like 25 percent attack speed on six on, on five people for six seconds. Like that's pretty huge. But um, I don't know I play Jana. She's still just a weak champion. Like a lot of people have been yeah. like on the Jana like train with Arden Sensor, but like it's just it's just not good. And then Crucible, I don't like the changes. Like, it used to be so good because it, w it wasn't very ex expensive. So you could build it on things like Leota and Thresh if you needed it. But now you're going to see tanks not build it anymore, which means you're going to have, like, more safer AD carries. Or, like, I guess people are either going to pick immobile AD carries and be less safe, or they're going to pick safer AD carries and put out less damage just because it's such a good investment for the support. So, um... Yeah, I'm not sure. We have, to, we have to play like with it competitively to know like what the effects are actually going to be, but um, that's just sort of like, yeah, after playing for two days, I guess. Yeah. Um, one last quick question about the new items. Uh, Essence Reaver. Are we going to see trap. Trace? Yeah. It seems like a bit of a trap stats-wise, but a lot of people have been saying um, that Jace might hit competitive play. A lot of the NA pros have been talking about that. Do you see that becoming a thing just because of one item change? I don't think it's going to be... Well, the item change might be, like, the push it needs out the door, but, like, I think Jace was already almost... It was already about to come back, so... Yeah, yeah. that's the answer to that question. Jace was already back before Essence Reaver even came out. Like yeah. The change that Essence Reaver, Re or Essence Reaver just allows him to build more mana and just permanently have it on. Yeah. You can just sit there, because he gets so much mana back anyway, and so you just do so much more damage. But, yeah, he was pretty good anyway, so... All right. Uh do you have any final questions? Um, yeah, just one, another quick one for Carbon about Skana. Um, do you think that a lot of his strength is going to come from dueling, or do you think, do you think he'll be able to survive these big junglers like um, Lee Sin and Elise now? Um, Elise is fine. Like Elise shouldn't be too much of a problem with Skana. Elise Sin, you still lose to, um, but you don't need to duel. Like, there's this idea, like, that you need to be able to duel the opposition jungler, and you don't. Like, if that were the case, like, champions like Eve would never get played. Um, like, Skana, uh, uh, like I said, we've only played in this patch for two days, and I think I've played, like, a total of four Skana games, and they were all solo queue, so that's totally different to competitive jungling. But, um, so far, my opinion is this early game is not that strong, and you still kind of just want to rush, rush six. Um, but, uh,. I don't think Elise is like Elise is a good duelist, but she's not like like that dangerous. You can deal with her better than you can deal with like Elise in. Um, and one last quick one, uh, another last quick one. Um, with the latest patch for forecast, Riot's been talking about uh, buffs to tanky junglers. Um, do you think that characters like Maokai and Nautilus could make an impact on the scene with new item changes? Um, yeah, if there are item changes, sure, why not? I mean, I love support junglers. I used to spam, I used to be, when, when OC servers first came out, I was known as, a, as like the Nautilus guy, because <laughs> I would play Nautilus every game. Um, uh, I'm more, I'd be more than happy for, for that to come back. Like, they're good champs, like they offer strong ganks and really good late game peel, but they, um, you don't need, like it's not about strong ganks as much. Like, you need utility, and a lot of them like are so one-dimensional, um, and they're not very good duelists. Um, so if there are item changes, they might come back, but um, we'll have to see, I suppose. All right, well, we have had some community questions, guys. Thank you very much for sending those in. Um, at Carbon and Egym, this is from Bun Bun. Uh, what are your expectations heading into the wildcard event, and have you been looking into other regions which will be competing there? Um, 
Well, we're the first team to qualify, so we can't really do any research until until we know who we're playing against sort of thing. <laughs> but, um, we've only been back for like two days. But like, hopefully we can put in a good showing, but we don't entirely know who we're versing, so there's no way to like judge it at this point. There is um, one team in Turkey, which is Dark Passage, and they are kind of like the IM of that region. Um, apparently they win every tournament, and no one has ever, no one even else even tries to qualify for any of this stuff. Um, so I've been watching some of their VODs, um, but IM did actually play against that team last year and win. So um, I've been doing a little bit of research, but I'm quietly confident that we at least will be able to take a couple games. All right, we have a question from Galaxy. What is AV going to spend their money on? <laughs> oh, <laughs> I've no idea. I I don't know. Mine's just going to look pretty in my bank account, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe yeah. I'll invest. Maybe I'll buy a boat. <laughs> As you do. <laughs> God damn it. All right. Uh, we have self-contained our spawn. In your opinion, is there a chance for an event such as Winters being hosted in New Zealand? Uh, yeah, definitely. Wow, that would be awesome. I think all the players would love that. Like, If we could get over to New Zealand, uh, I'm sure, like, A, the community would do something awesome over there. Um and be like being to New Zealand once before in the past like they have some nice locations for stuff like that um, we would have the best photo shoot of all time um, but <laughs> yeah so I think that the answer is yes they will look at doing something soon is my gut feeling mm -hmm. uh, Union asked okay here's my question you guys said that we have players in university and school will they be able to go to Germany um, well we're in the process of figuring that out. We already had to get an exam moved so that Aaron um, Choo Choo's could play um, last weekend because he had an exam on the Monday and he wasn't going to get back to Sydney like, like until like three hours before his exam or something. So we already had to have one exam moved and hopefully we don't have any issues. Right now it looks like, we'll, like it won't be an issue, but um, only time will tell, I suppose. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, Scumbag King, question for Carbon. What was it like winning the game and celebrating on stage while standing there with no shoes? <laughs> will you be doing this wild card tournament in Germany and it's just Aussie grit clothing style? Um, I don't know. It depends how hot it is up there. So um, <laughs> under the lights, it's actually like deceptively warm. And um, when you have to play for like five hours, you get really sweaty and like... The theory, my theory was, right, like, I wasn't planning to not wear shoes, but, like, it was so hot and my feet were so fatty, sweaty, and I was, like, it was after game one already, so I was, like, I'll just take my shoes off and, like, when we finish, I'll just put them back on when we go back out on stage. But then, like, we ended up winning and I was just so excited I forgot to put them back on and I just ran out there and I was walking. I remember after we shook hands, I was walking back across the stage towards, like, the caster's desk to um, like receive our jackets or whatever and I just remember thinking like I can feel the ground really really well at the moment <laughs> <laughs> and I realised I wasn't wearing any shoes I was just like oh shit <laughs> oh my god I love that you say you guys get sweaty wear full suit tie in front of those damn lights oh, well, wish I could take so my disgusting. shoes off yeah. yeah well you should have man no one would have noticed we could have prepared <laughs> for brothers front row would have taken three steps back dude yeah, we're all wearing hoodies as well feet. Like, Carbon took his hoodie off. He was smart, but the rest of us just kind of dealt with it. We were just like, no, nah, we just sat there. <laughs> All right. Uh, Alpha Klein has asked, legitimate question, though. When Carbon plays, does he play better without shoes on? Um, I don't know, to be honest. Like, I don't <laughs> ever play with shoes at home. So, like, I suppose you could make an argument for, like, me being comfortable not wearing shoes. Like, I'm not wearing shoes right now. Uh, I don't think it really matters that much. Oh, it was more just, it was really hot and, um, yeah, I just wanted to be comfortable. <laughs> no worries. And so, Jacko, 1419, my question to the AVA boys. Realistically, how do you think you will do in the wildcard tournament and what are you most hoping to get out of going to the tournament and winning? Um, well, I think we answered the, like, how do we think we'll do before. Like, we don't know who we're playing against, so, like, it's a bit... It's impossible to make any sort of judgment now. But, um, what was the last one? What are you most hoping to get out of 
I don't know, get to go to Germany. That's sick. Like, <laughs> that's that's just it. It's it's so cool. Like, if we won and we got to go to Korea, that's like, holy. It would just be unreal. Oh, my I, God. I don't know what I would do with myself. Beating <laughs> IM was just, like, mind-blowing enough. We, I, the day after, I still, like, on the plane home, I was still just, like, we can't, I couldn't really believe that we had done it. And so, like, winning at Germany would just be, like, yeah. All right, uh, one for Spawn. After that best of five, uh, do you believe that Choo Choo showed a fair bit of his skill and will it be enough for people to fear him as a good mid laner? Uh, I answered that one in Twitch chat. That dude's a god. Like, there is no question about it. He should definitely be up there with, like, the Swift for King conversation now. Like, uh, I guess you have to throw Heavens in there as well because Heavens is pretty good. And Little Cutie Cheese is obviously a different mid laner, I guess, but he's also pretty good. But in regards to Choose particularly, yeah, I think that he showed that with all the games, he could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Swiffer, and they put a lot of pressure on their mid lane. Like, anyone that thinks that you're just playing against Swiffer when you play I am doesn't watch games, because Spooks is literally that dude's shadow. He, like, does not <laughs> leave that lane at all. So, like, Choo Choo's to survive all of that pressure and come out massive is really good. And then you see him on his champions, like Yasuo, where he didn't have the best game kills-wise, but he's just a farming machine. Like, that dude finds farm around the map. So, yeah, in regards to whether he is up there in the conversation, I think there's no doubt, like, everyone has to acknowledge this guy is great. Is and he's doing it at school. Yeah. Just we're very happy was... you said that. Yeah, we were, we were <laughs> laughing a lot, because, like, Heaven's got... Uh, interviewed and in his interview they like asked him about the mid laners and we were all sitting down like at the event like on one of the TVs watching it and when he didn't put shoes in there oh it was so funny it was just he was like, so upset you could just like yeah. <laughs> he was just like yeah he was just like why does no one mention me no one ever <laughs> mentions me it's like because you're awful <laughs> ouch <laughs> alright here's one um, how did you come up with the name erect gymnast <laughs> I think we were talking about I, this before the podcast started. Yeah, I wish there was a good story, but I'm sorry, I'm not a gymnast, and there's nothing wrong to do with the other part of the name. It was just funny, and so I just like I made it when I was in like high school, and it's kind of just stuck around. Um, I've just used it for everything, like online gaming wise. So I, I wish there was like a minky length story to that, but uh, sadly, there's not. <laughs> we don't. <laughs> um, and one last one. Uh, for the for both of you, um, was Shotzi the only one that cried, or did any other player cry afterward? Oh, uh, no, nah, it, it, it was only Shots. Shots he walked in backstage, <laughs> and it was just like a blubbering mess. He was trying to congratulate <laughs> us, but he couldn't say anything. He's just like, boom, 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 boom. <laughs> and we were just like, oh, come here, man. It's all right. Uh, happy Big birthday, to Shots, by the way. Happy yeah, yeah, it's Shots. Shots. Happy birthday, Shots. Today, so happy birthday, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I think our winners for those questions were Scumbag King and Takua16. If you guys can hang around after the show. Actually, I think uh, if you follow the page, we can message you with the, the right award skin codes. Yay, congratulations. Um, and I think that might be it. Do you have any last questions you want to ask, Ethan? Uh, yeah, we just had one funny question to finish it off. Um, <laughs> considering you guys are traveling over to Europe, um, you will be spending some quality time on the plane. If you had to choose any uh, player to be sitting next to for a 20-hour flight, who would they be? Not necessarily on your team either. Oh, so like just us or what? Uh, just in general. Uh, in the pro scene, NA, Korea... Oh, um, like you can go, go first. You go, you go. I'll think. Uh, who's gonna go? Oh, you go. Go. Uh, go. go. You, All right. You go too. Um, who would I like to sit between? Um, I'd like to sit between uh, probably Aaron and Bryce for different reasons. I feel like Aaron <laughs> would be really quiet and like you would have to <laughs> worry about him like doing anything. But I need to keep an eye on Bryce because. Bryce likes to sit on the end, other end of the plane and like annoy you anyway. So we were flying, <laughs> we were on the way to we were flying on the way to Perth, and Bryce is sitting like three rows behind us, like on the other side of the plane. And I'm not sure whether like whether you guys like the last time you guys flew, 
but they have like the seats on the back of the plane but they also have like an instant messaging service and like <laughs> I was watching a movie and like the instant messaging service like tabs you out of the movie and like you have to you have to like go through the whole process again and like it's so hard it takes so long and I was trying to watch this movie and every five minutes he was inviting me to a convo and like the movie was getting cancelled <laughs> and he was sitting so, so far good. away he was sitting oh, so far away I couldn't yell at him so like I need to keep him next to me so if he does that I could just punch him in the arm or something <laughs> it was so good just watching because like we were all like all of us left or like a lot of us left from Melbourne I'm from Canberra but I was through Melbourne and so there's like Roughly, I guess, like a night of us, and we're like, we all knew where each other was sitting, and so like, you can just add everybody into this conversation. And just like the first time you do it, just looking at their reactions, like you're just watching a movie, and suddenly, like, seat 16A wants to talk to you. They're just like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> but, um, before I answer mine, I'd say I wasn't the most annoying, bloody Minky Whale. I would not like to sit next to him because he was sitting behind <laughs> Swiffer yeah. on the plane. And it was like Simon was trying to sleep and he's just like, sitting there like question. playing with his ears and like, he was just like grabbing his like ears and oh, it was so bad. But um, you said pros from like other scenes as well, right? Yeah. Like, so I'll go with two answers. You could go like, I could go like full PR and choose like Mato and Mad Life or something. Like, I don't know, like two Korean supports and like learn a lot, I guess. If I could speak Korean, that'd be great. But like <laughs> in terms of... It's long higher. An actual answer, I'd, I'd probably go with like Double Lift and Aphromoo, just because they're so cool and it'd be so much fun just like sitting with them, yeah. Yeah, Same I don't think I've ever heard a bad word about Aphromoo. Yeah, yeah. And he's like, just he's just a god now. Like he went from being yeah. sort of like, like B tier sort of thing and suddenly like they're just like one of the best bot lanes in NA, so yeah. Alrighty, um, now... Thanks, guys. We're going to start to wrap up. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, any shout-outs you'd like to make? Just starting with Jake. Oh, yeah. Cool. So just shout-out Riot, of course, because they give us the game, and I guess none of us would actually be talking about it if they didn't. Um, shout-out to you guys for putting us on the show. That's pretty cool. Uh, and Jason behind the scenes for feeding me all the lines that I have to say. So I hope <laughs> I didn't let you down, buddy. Um, Shout out to Atlas because he got me my job and uh, he's a pretty sick co-caster. So I love that dude. And uh, Pastry Time also deserves a special mention. I uh, hope I made you proud, Dad. And uh, yeah, cheers for helping me get good at casting. <laughs> yeah, um, I guess I'll go with shout, shout out to Riot and you guys for having us on the show, I guess. Um, shout out to AV and all our sponsors. Um, it's pretty cool. We have them there to support us. Um, yeah, cool. Shout out to the viewers for watching. It's been cool. And Garbage? Yeah, no, I suppose I have all the ones that Bryce had with AV and uh, the sponsors, which are Plantronics, Asus, um, Scorp Tech. Um, I can't remember the rest. <laughs> um, you should probably get out the list. Thing. <laughs> I should have got a look at my name. I got all the names in there. Corsair, I think. Well, I mentioned that one. Uh, outside of that, yeah, obviously Riot, um, Benji especially, Riot Benji. Um, huge, you know, like he does so much for us. He's a great guy. Um, shout out to uh, Riot Conquistador, <laughs> the uh, the guy who helped us out on the Friday. He was wicked yeah, as Ivan? well. Oh, yeah, it's Ivan. Amazing, um, and outside of that, obviously, shout out to you guys for having me on. Shout out to all the fans. Just a reminder that I have more codes than I know what to do with. So if anyone wants Arcade Heckle, Riot Blitz, just ask. Um, can I, sorry, a pen to mine. Shout out to this writer. I don't know his name, but he bought me a drink while we're in Perth, and he's a legend. He's like a web <laughs> developer guy. And then uh, shout out to my mate Nick, who's spamming me in league chat right now. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. All right, guys. Well, thank you to all the viewers that joined us today. Thank you for entertaining us in Twitch chat. And for your questions, I remember to the two winners to stick around um, and message us afterwards. We'll give you those then. So uh, that is your Q podcast for today. We'll be back next Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. If you enjoyed the show, please like and follow us on Twitter and Twitch. Also, we do have a YouTube channel where everything gets uploaded to. And we also have a fantastic web page. So if you guys are into reading articles, our people write very interesting stuff, actually. So that you can find that at geoq.net.au. You can follow me on 
uh, well, Twitter, I guess. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, at Alyssa Fallot. And you may also find my wonderful co-host, Ethan, at ID Authoral. And this is GeoQ Podcast. We're signing out. Thanks, guys. Welcome to Summoner's Rift. Thank you.